Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see each of you here. It is a good thing to praise the Lord. It's good that we are here this morning. I pray that we experience and feel that goodness from the Lord. Some announcements that we have before we move into uh, further into our worship service this morning. A reminder to everyone that we will be having evening church here at 6 o'clock. So we invite everyone to come back at 6 o'clock for evening service. Also, as far as the calendar goes, please make note that our annual business meeting for the church for 2021 will be on Monday, February 1st at 7.30 p.m. We'll be voting for deacon positions, youth, women's ministry, and there will be other positions voted on as well at that time. And we will have absentee ballots available next week for those who are not able to be there then. But again, we would encourage everyone who is physically possible to be here to please be here for that. Um, a couple other announcements, a reminder, our New Year's Eve service, we had uh, the people who attended the New Year's Eve service fill out a little card or a slip of paper would suffice to give to the leadership that would be your, for lack of a better term, spiritual goal or aspiration, something you really want to focus on in this year in your relationship with the Lord so that we can pray for you. And we have, I would say maybe 80% of the church, we have gotten uh, a receipt for that, something that you could hand to us. And, and we've been, Scott and I have been praying over those, those desires, those requests that you have. And so I would ask if you haven't done that yet, you can just hand it to Scott or hand it to me after the service. If you would like to put your name on it, that's fine. If you would like to leave your name off of it, that's fine too. The Lord knows who's filling those things out. Okay, let's bow in prayer. Our God, we invite you into our presence here this morning. We know, Lord, by your spirit that you are here among us. We invite you, Lord, to make your presence known through the proclamation of your word, through the experience of singing songs of praise to you. It is good to do that, as we've been reminded by the verse this morning on the screen. We ask, God, that we would feel and know that goodness. We pray, God, for the word that will go out. We ask, God, your blessing upon it. We pray, God, for the Brumbelo family and the continued physical suffering and challenges that Ravim and Nathaniel face and that the family faces in caring for them. We pray, God, that you would be their supporter, the lifter of their heads, that you, God, would be their strength and that you would help them to remain steadfast in their duties and their responsibilities and in their calling to serve you. We pray, God, for those who are not able to be here this morning in our fellowship, who would desire to be here but cannot be, we, we lift them up to you. We know, Lord, there are people who would like to be here, that we miss their presence. We pray, God, for your blessing and your comfort and your strengthening for them, that they would experience your presence in their lives. We pray, Lord, around the, around the globe for those on the mission field who have been struggling because of the restrictions of the virus, who have seen their ministries uh, suffer financial setbacks, who have not been able to minister in the way that they would because of the limitations on gathering. There's so many different limitations that the world could set upon us, God, but you can smash all those down. You can overcome any barriers that are erected in this world. We ask God for the force of your gospel to continue to make its imprint. And for all those who are serving around the world for that end, we ask God that you would bless them. We pray, God, for Christians who are persecuted in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, all over the world, wherever your people are gathering in secret or because they are fearful for their lives or because the government is out to get them. We pray, God, for your encouragement and your steadfast spirit in their lives. We pray, God, for our own government as we seek a peaceful transition of power in this country, something that we have taken granted for many, many years. We ask, God, that you, your hand and your spirit of peace would be upon your people, upon anyone, Lord, who is seeking to disrupt or to cause violence on those uh, who are seeking to transition to power in this country. We pray, God, for your spirit to reign. We pray, God, that you would demolish any power or authority that is seeking to undermine and cause violence and bloodshed. We pray, God, for your peace. We thank you, God, for this time. We ask you, again, that we invite you now to be with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's all stand and turn to number 17, verses 1 through 4. Verses 1, 2, and 4.
92, verses 1 through 3.
finally number 89, verses 1 through 3. Children should be dismissed for taking your church on if they left yet or not. Good morning, everybody. I'm struggling like John because when you have a mask on, you can't get this set up ahead of time. How's everybody's week? Ducky. Ducky? There's a little bit of rain. Ducky's probably liked it. Um, we are going to look, our main text today is going to be in John chapter 7. If you want to find that, feel free. I'll talk just a little bit before actually reading that though. And I've entitled our message today, A Living Tabernacle. So, um, to get a little bit of background and to put some context for understanding what we're going to be looking at today in our text, uh, we're going to look just a few verses in the Old Testament. Um, the verses that deal with the instituting of some different uh, festivals and ceremonies that um, the Jewish uh, people would do on a yearly basis. And if, if you looked at all at John chapter 7, then you'll notice it's going to be the Feast of of the tabernacles. And so we're going to look just at some verses that talk exactly what that feast was about before we actually read that text. And those verses are in Leviticus 23. You don't need to turn there. It's just a couple verses I'm going to read. Uh, verses 20, um, sorry, Leviticus 23, and I'm going to read verse 33 through 36, and then 39 through 43. If you want to follow along, that's fine, or just pay attention. So the Feast of Tabernacles. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days. The first day is a sacred assembly, do no regular work. For seven days present offerings made to the Lord by fire, and on the eighth day hold a sacred assembly and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. It is the closing assembly. It is the closing assembly. Do no regular work. And then skipping to verse 39. So beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, you are, you 
after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival to the Lord for seven days. The first day is a day of rest, and the eighth day is also a day of rest. On the first day, you are to take choice fruit from trees and palm fronds, leafy branches, and poplars, and rejoice before the Lord your God. For seven days, celebrate this festival as a festival to the Lord. For seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate in the seventh month. Live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses announced to the Israelites these appointed feasts. So this Feast of the Tabernacle, it was also called the Sukkoth in, in the, the, um, the Jewish language. And that word is Hebrew for booths or tents. The Jewish people constructed makeshift tents just as the Israelites while roaming in the desert for the feast to, commemor to commemorate their liberation from Egypt by the hand of God. During this festival, each day would bring specific festivities and traditions. The priests would make daily sacrifices the streets would be full of people celebrating and engaging in traditional activities. The Feast of Tabernacles is a seven-day autumn celebration honoring, honoring the 40-year pilgrimage of the Israelites in the desert. Along with the Passover and the Festival of Weeks, Sukkoth is also three notable pil pilgrimage feasts found in the Bible when all Jewish men were expected to come before the Lord in the temple in Jerusalem. And these feasts would oftentimes be attended, not by just the men, but by their entire families. So this kind of sets the stage of what we're gonna be looking at in our text in John chapter seven. If you can kind of just picture this, this feast was made to commemorate the Israelites coming out and being taken away, and it was a time of celebration. And the time of the year that this normally would be um, celebrated was kind of at the end of harvest, and so they were also celebrating the fact of God's plenty, the blessings that he has provided for them through crops and things like that. And through the festival, they would be having sacrifices throughout the week. The priests would be doing certain type of rituals. People would be going to the temple. And the interesting thing is when they would make their pilgrimage to the city of Jerusalem, they made their own little booths and tents that they would just set up in the streets to live in for this one week period of time. So today's text, if you want to, if you flipped over to the Leviticus there, you can turn to John chapter 7. Today's text is going to center around the celebration of this Feast of Tabernacles. The key figures we will be reading about in this text will be Jesus, will be some Jewish leaders, and some crowds that find themselves there in Jerusalem that are part of this celebration. We also know that uh, from the scripture in Leviticus that we read, we're looking at a time frame of about a seven or eight day period as we read this text. So let's go to our text. We're going to read the entire chapter, chapter 7. <clears throat> After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, You ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. That's an interesting statement where you read that and it says even his own brothers didn't believe in him. We know that through some time, a couple of his brothers were key and instrumental uh, pieces in, in the gospel story. Continuing on verse 6. Therefore Jesus told them, the right time has not yet come for any time um, sorry, the right time for me has not yet come. For you, any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that it does evil. You go to the feast. I am not yet going up to the feast because for me the time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he also went, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the feast of the, of the Jews were... Now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, where is this man? 
Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about it for fear of the Jews. And it's interesting, as you think about this festival and all the people who were there, it, they were looking for Jesus. And because Jesus didn't go with the mass amount of crowd that would make that pilgrimage to uh, Jerusalem to celebrate this feast, he kind of went there in secret. It's interesting just to hear the, the kind of the state that that city, the buzz that was going on. And it almost reminds me a little bit of how we're kind of preparing for the inauguration this week in Washington, D.C. And people are going there and all the, all the different stuff that is happening in that city almost kind of reminds me of, I can almost picture this scene being something similar to that. And I'm asking, where's Jesus? Where's, where's this guy who's doing all these things and he wasn't there publicly yet? Continuing on verse 14. Not until halfway through the festival, did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach? The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself, but he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is the man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law, yet not one of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle, and you were all astonished. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, through, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. Now, if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, Isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly, and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? But we know where this man is from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his time had not yet come. Still many in the crowd put their faith in him. They said, when Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you only for a short time, and then I will go to the one who sent me. You who look for me, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go to where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is a prophet. Others said he is the Christ. And still others asked, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees, who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted. Has any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing about the law. There is a curse on them. 
Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So Jesus starts um, out in Galilee knowing that the Jewish leaders were um, trying to take his life. And there were multiple times throughout the book of John that we can see that this happened. In John 5, 18, for this reason they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. In John 8, 59, at this they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipped away from the temple grounds. And in John 10, 39, again they tried to seize him, but he escaped to their grasp. And in John eleven fifty three, so from that day forward, they plotted to take his life. And it's interesting about the timing because in our text today, we see that Jesus often referred to the fact that my timing is not yet come. And it's amazing to think about God and how he works, that in his timing, it's the perfect stroke of time. God works in a way that is not set on man's time clock. Not set on the world's time clock, but it's set on his own time clock of what God wants to accomplish and to happen. And as you think about that, think about your life when God is working, we have opportunity to take advantage of that time. Because God is affording that for each of us who are sitting here today. We have that time to work in his ultimate plan. What was it about Jesus that rubbed the Jewish leaders the wrong way? Why were they always trying to seek to get him? Were they jealous that Jesus had so many people following him in such a short amount of time? We get a glimpse of that um, today because we can see that there were a lot of people who followed Jesus by what he taught. Was it because Jesus always seemed to get the upper hand when the leaders let, tried to make him look silly? Were they, so th were they so threatened by what Jesus was trying to do? And why is it that in our day and age, it seems like Christians seemingly have a bad name and a bad reputation. Well, in part, I think it's due to probably a few bad seeds who have stained the perception of the church. Um, but just like with Jesus and the leaders of that day, it all boils down to this. And I think it boils down to truth. If we look at verse 7 again, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. And in verse 16, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself, but he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is the man of truth. There is nothing false about him. And has Moses, has Moses not given you the law, yet not one of you keeps the law? And again, why are you trying to kill me? This idea of truth, living in truth, we know that everything that Jesus did centered around truth because he was truth. And as we think about what truth means to us in this day and age, how does that affect the way that I conduct myself as I go to work, as I go to school, as I'm with my neighbors, as I'm around friends and family, people who may not know what it means to follow Christ. How does truth penetrate and change my life? We continue reading verse 21. Jesus says, I did one miracle and you were all astonished. And it's interesting, this one miracle that he's referring to was back when he healed the paralytic man um, back in John chapter five. And if you remember that story, um, the man was waiting by the pool of Siloam to be carried into the water when the water would move so that he would be healed and, and um, he was never able to get there because he couldn't move. He was paralyzed. And Jesus told him to um, take up his mat and to walk. And it's interesting because this happened on the Sabbath day and all the rules that the Pharisees had concerning the Sabbath day was you weren't supposed to carry your mat. And so when Jesus tells this guy to get up and carry his mat, I'm sure he doesn't think, well, it's the Sabbath. I'm not going to get up and pick up my mat and go walk. I am healed. I can do this now. I'm doing what this man says. He just healed me. And so the Pharisees didn't like that, and they found something to try to come to Jesus with to say, 
you did the wrong thing. You can't do this on the Sabbath. And Jesus is, is again, referring back to this truth, this idea of everything Jesus did was truth. The things that weren't truth, he pointed out. And like in verse uh, 7, it says, he points out the evil that people are doing, and that's the reason why they were trying to kill him. I love at the end of those verses after verse 21 um, getting down to verse 24 when he says, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Ultimately, truth helps us to make that right judgment. We know that if we're following truth and believing in truth, we cannot make a wrong judgment. It's all about making right judgments. Stop judging by mere appearances and make right judgments. You see, that's truth. Truth be brings about right judgments. It doesn't draw attention to ourselves, but it leads us to draw attention to Christ. And oftentimes, the truth hurts, and we will be disliked and called out, maybe made fun of, maybe ridiculed, because we are holding up what truth is. But truth needs to reign in our lives. Continuing on here. Back to verse uh, 14. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. So you got to picture this. The feast is halfway through. Maybe it's day three, maybe day four. By the time he gets into the temple courts to go start teaching. It says the Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? And in verse 45 and 46, we see the temple guard as they return back from their task of going to apprehend Jesus when they get back to the leaders there. And it says, finally, the temple, car, temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? And they replied, no one ever spoke the way this man does. What is it about the way that Jesus spoke? I think ultimately it was because it was centered around truth. And when truth is spoken, it gets people's attention. When truth is spoken, it makes us not bring glory to ourselves, as these verses talk about that we've read today, but it brings glory to Christ. When we center our life and live our life in that truth, I believe people see and know and understand that there's something different. And like Jesus in this case, his words meant something to the people because it was centered around truth. In Acts chapter 4, verse 8 through 13, then Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for the act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom he crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you build as rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were <clears throat> unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. I think ultimately this is what it looks like to be living in truth and to speaking truth. Cuts to the core it removes the attention from ourselves, and it brings the honor and glory to God. Think about those words where they said they were so bold with their speech, and then they realized that these men were with Jesus. The truth, the way, the life. Jesus himself gave them that truth to speak and show in their lives. Skipping to verse uh, 30. Seven, you know, from our text there. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice. Now, again, you got to think about this for a second. Remember, uh, during this feast, they would have different ceremonies and things that would happen uh, throughout the week that they would celebrate. They were, you know, they had sacrifices. And as I was studying for this this last day, one of the rituals that they would that they would do is. The priests would go out to that pool of Siloam that was out in front of the temple, and they would have jars. I don't know how big they were, but they would fill them with water from that pool. 
They would take it inside the temple, and part of the ritual was to pour it out onto the temple, and that water would just rush, and it would be a symbol for the prosperity, for the amount of rain that they would be uh, praying and asking God to provide. And so you have this image of this water ceremony that's taking place, and now Jesus on this last day, maybe that ceremony had just taken place, I don't know. But he says in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. So you have this imagery of the people who may have just watched this water ceremony. And now Jesus is speaking and teaching this and saying, if you're thirsty, come to me. Attention is drawn to the water. And he continues on, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within them. They may have just seen this flow of, of water from that pool of Bethsaida that was, uh, sorry, the pool of Siloam that was poured over the, the altar and, a, and in a stream. It may have just happened in that imagery that they could have seen. Another account reminds me of the, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Um, if you remember when um, Jesus asked for a drink and, and um, she, she was puzzled with the fact that even Jesus was, was coming to her, who was, who was um, not a full-blooded Jew, to even speak to her. Uh, verse 10 of chapter 4, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. That was the water from the well. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. This living water that Jesus is referring to here offers, that he offers to the woman at the well, it's welling up and it brings eternal life. It's our salvation and the water that Jesus talks about in our text. With the imagery of the priests who may have just performed this water ceremony, these streams of living water will flow from within us. Water brings life. Water brings refreshment. Water brings washing. The accomplishment of what water does is amazing if you stop and think about it. Something as simple as water. Are you thirsty this morning? Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, come to him and drink. He's waiting to bring these streams of living water to each of us. Let us well up inside and flow freely and produce the abundance that God wants for us in our lives. So as we look through this scripture and the impacts that Jesus made uh, during this yearly festival, I have to stop and wonder if this particular year was really different. Um, every year this festival took place, and every year I wonder it was more of just ritual, the same things over and over. And as Jesus made his way to this feast and halfway through started his teaching, I wonder how different that week started looking for the people who attended. Jesus' teachings threw the crowd a curveball and helped them ultimately know truth. And that the truth Jesus showed, coupled with tapping into by believing in him, that he would supply the living water that would flow through the people that called on his name. What does this celebration mean for us today? Well, Christ definitely wants us to focus on the truth, to live in the truth, and to surround ourselves and our lives with the truth of the gospel. Sharing that gospel news with others, having truth permeate every aspect of our lives and being part of that as letting truth reign in us. Streams of living water need to be flowing from within us and this Feast of the Tabernacles should also invoke, invoke in us four more things that I want to talk about this morning briefly. And I'm sure the people um, who attended this feast regularly had these same ideas and four things that, that would be pointed out to them. The first thing was God's salvation. And if you look at Isaiah 12, 2 through 6, it says, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust not. I will, I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. 
With joy you draw water from wells of salvation. In that day you will say, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations that he has done what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the worlds. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. For great is the Holy One of Israel among you. And in Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one, of, no one else. For there is no one under heaven given to mankind by which one must be saved. So we need to let our salvation be lived out in our lives. The importance of what that means to us, to eat, to eat, to sleep, to drink. Every aspect of our life focus on the salvation that Christ brings to us. The second thing, that God is our shelter. Psalms 91, 4, he will cover you with feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield. That imagery of being drawn underneath his wings for that protection. Psalm 27, 5, for in the day of trouble you will keep me safe in dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. When we were in the battles and we were living our daily life, Christ is there for us. He's there to help us, to protect us. He's that shelter we can turn to. Number three, for God's provision. And I'm, we're not going to turn there because we're running short on time, but if you remember 1 Kings 17, Elijah, how the ravens brought food to him as he was out in the wilderness. And I think about the children of Israel who, when they needed the food, manna was provided for them by God. The provisions that God brings in big and in small ways, sometimes noticed, sometimes unnoticed, those daily provisions God makes for us. The fourth thing is God's trustworthiness. And in Psalms 111, 7, the works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. And another reference in 2 Samuel 7, verse 27, the Lord God, the almighty God of Israel, you have revealed to your servant David, and this is David's prayer, saying, I will build a house for you so your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Sovereign Lord, you are God. Your covenant is trustworthy. You have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue in your sight for you, sovereign Lord, have spoken. And with your blessings, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. Do we trust in man's rules or do we trust in God's ultimate rule? How do we find our confidence? How do we live our life knowing that God is trust trustworthy and everything that he promises, he will see us through. As we think about this tabernacle and this Feast of Tabernacles and a living tabernacle, I would like to encourage myself today, I would like to encourage you today, that as you live your life, you can be grounded in God's truth, that you can have that free-flowing living water from our lives, that people around us see that, that we can truly and confidently live in God's salvation that we can have him as our shelter. That we know that he provides and the blessings that he gives to us. And ultimately, the things that God says and does in his word are trustworthy. And we can live in them and we can make them ultimately reign in our lives. May God bless this word.
it's all student proof. Lord, thank you for this time that we have together, and despite the uh, restrictions, we can still meet as a body and as a family, and um, yeah, help us to always remember that you uh, will carry us and show us how we can seek you and rely on you to do that us as we go out from here. Uh, give us rest before the start of a new week. And in your name I pray, amen. A reminder, evening service here tonight at 6. We'd love to see everyone here back. God bless you.